I was pretty excited, pretty fired up to uh, talk to Blackie Lawless from Wasp today on Talking Rock. Hey, first of all, man, uh, just a, an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Been a big fan for a long time, so I'm so grateful that you had a chance to call in. Well, thanks for taking the time. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, so the tour is coming up here, and uh, of course, playing in Detroit here at Harpo is a place I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, coming oh, up yeah. on November 11th, but man, this is gonna. This looks like a pretty grueling tour. You've got a lot of back to back dates on this one. It's what we do. To be honest with you, we don't like days off. You know, it's uh, there's not a lot to do. I mean, you know, we've done this before. We've We've been most places, and we've seen most of whatever there is to <laughs> to to be seen, you know. So it's like, um, you know, we just prefer to to do it like that. Now I was going to say, so how how do you keep up your voice, and how do you just keep going on that the, the day to day grind like that? Well, that's um, that goes back a long way to the the beginning when we started. I had a problem with my voice, and I ruptured the entire left side. And they told me I was probably never going to sing again. And um, <clears throat> I had to go for nine weeks where I couldn't speak. And I had to take a pad and a pencil with me wherever I went. Went to a restaurant, had to write everything down. You know, your phone rang, you just let it ring. You know, nine weeks you go through that. And uh, But long story short, um, I went to, to therapy after it was uh, <clears throat> starting to heal. And they taught me exercises. And over that period of time, you know, I just started doing them, and I got stronger and stronger and stronger. Not only did I get back to where I was, I was better than I was before the accident. Mm. So, I mean, the doctor said to me, he goes, when you're watching the Olympics and the guys are getting ready to do that 100-meter dash, he goes, what are they over there doing before the gun goes off? And I said, stretching. He goes, duh. <laughs> you know, so it's like... You know, I just learned those little tips, and it's uh, if I take care of it, it takes care of me. Yeah, no question. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's got to be uh, like uh, like I said, just kind of a grueling thing. What year was this that you're talking about? This was before our, the year before our first album came out. First album came out in '84, so it was '83 when the accident happened. All right, so yeah, you're talking yeah, many many years ago. I thought that maybe that was uh, maybe that's you know was in in the middle of the career or something like that. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. I thought it, we thought it was over before it even started. Yeah. Now, this uh, this production that you're going to be bringing out on tour with you, tell me a little bit about that. We've looked at the 40 years of what we've done, and we said to ourselves, what would we want to see? And so we're trying to do a sampling of everything over that period of time. But I would say that there is a heavier emphasis on what it looked like for the first three or four years. And that is something we've never done before, to take it back to where you know, the show started in the beginning. And to do that, we've come up with this design that looks like an old type of 1930s, 1940s carnival. And it's very dark. It's very spooky looking. <laughs> and it has, in, it has these, like, freak show banners all over the place. And these banners move in and out, and there's video screens behind them. And so you're going to see videos, stuff that we've done throughout our career, where these banners, like I said, the banners will move up and down, and the video is behind it. So it's it's kind of cool. It's a, it's a unique production. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. Yeah. Now, you know, here in 2022, things are obviously a lot different than 40 years ago when you guys started. And I know that, like, Kid Rock just posted something not that long ago about, you know, fans taking videos and posting them online and kind of ruining the surprises for other fans. Are, are you, I mean, would you ever think of doing something like a no-phones policy? I just went to a Jack White concert a few uh, a month or two ago that was no phones, and it was it was actually really cool. I, from a performer's perspective... I heard Don Henley say one time that he looked out in the crowd and he says they're watching their phones instead of watching the artist. And he said that was distressing for him. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> from our perspective, you can understand that. I would say the surprise element, especially with what we're doing, I have mixed emotions about it because you want people to take away the memory of what they've just experienced, especially for what we're going to do on this this tour. They're going to want that. But at the same time, 
having it for yourself is one thing. Posting it so other people can see, because there are going to be surprises in this, and I would prefer that they stayed that way, but I don't see how that's going to happen. Yeah. Now, uh, other, other than, as you said, you know, doing a no phones, and I, I really don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and plus, you know, I always thought, too, that the phones kind of help spread your word as well. They do. You know, I mean, there's definitely a give and take with it. Yeah. So are you guys uh, working on some new stuff right now? How, how far along are you with that? Well, you know, it's one of those kind of things that when you were a kid, you'd stick your head in the kitchen and ask your mom when dinner was ready. She goes, when it's on the table. <laughs> yeah, my wife still says that, yeah. <laughs> it's a little like that, you know. It's like I'm one of those kind of guys that I've done this my whole career that it's not over until it's literally in the can. And, because, and the reason I say that is because as a perfectionist, if you've got an idea at the the last minute, I want to go in and do it. I don't want to leave any idea unexamined before it actually goes out to the public. And that has caused grief at record companies more than once. Uh, you know, I, we on our second album, there was something I wanted to do like that. And I knew it was too late because we had turned everything in. And I went, I was, went down to Capitol Records, and I was <clears throat> in the office of uh, the president. And I thought it was kind of funny. He didn't think it was, but at the time, I said to him, I said, you know, I said, I really would like to do something else on that record. And he's trying to be nice to me. And he says, well, I don't think that would really be possible right now. And I, I said, well, why not? And he says, well, we just shipped a quarter of a million records yesterday. <laughs> and I said, so you're saying I can't do it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and the look that was on his face. <laughs> That is funny. Yeah, I it's like it it's, it's, it's like it's like when you when you finish a record. I mean, do you ever think it's finished, or is it just like you you you're just done with it? I'm not one of those guys that that's always going to lament it. When it's done, it's done. Yeah. And what you try to do at that point is you literally put the lid on it and say that's what that is. Because I approach records. You know, when we were making our first record, the, the engineer that we were working with. I came in the studio, it was on a Sunday Sunday afternoon, and it was just me and him in there that, I, that day, and when I got in, he said, um, or he was really quiet that afternoon, and that wasn't like him, this guy, he was bubbly, he was one of these guys, always had some crap going on, and, and I, part of the reason I tell this story is the Detroit Motown situation there. Yeah. This guy had worked with Marvin Gaye. And he's sitting there, and he goes, I just got a phone call. This says Marvin Gaye was murdered mm. last night. And so we didn't work for, for maybe a couple hours after that. And I just let him talk, you know, because I could tell he, he just needed to, to get it out. And during the course of that conversation, he said to me, he says, you know, one thing I learned from Marvin, he says, you make records that reflect who you are at that moment in your life. You don't try to make records that you think that people want to hear. You don't try to do whatever's hot on the charts. You do a record to reflect who you are at that moment. And I found that to be very, very true. So what I try to do is take that theory and say, I'm working on this now. When this part of my life is done, we shut the door on it, and then we move on. And so I don't try to you know, to carry any of the the what ifs with me that, you know, we didn't do this at that moment or it could have been better or whatever, because you torture yourself if you do that. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a snapshot in time in your musical journey. Absolutely. And I tell people that exact phrase. I go, these are little time capsules. They're snapshots. And you got to try to make them the best they can be, because once they're done, they're done. You ain't getting them back. You know, so they better be as good as you can make them at the time. Yeah, I was so excited to talk to you uh, last night. I went over to my neighbor's house and we were watching a bunch of old uh, Wasp videos. Some of them I don't know if I if I ever really saw before. But yeah, talking about a snapshot in time, man. Uh, some of those were just, I mean, just so good and such classics. And watching the live stuff and that, it's just uh, it's just so good and such an honor. Like I said, do I talk to you today? Uh, the thirtieth anniversary, of the Crimson Idol is this year as well. Are you going to throw anything extra into the show uh, when you come through the states? You know, we haven't we haven't actually started rehearsals yet. 
we're talking about it. You know, I'm a little torn between what to do because trying to serve two masters and at this moment, because you're absolutely correct, having not been in America for 10 years and this being the 40th anniversary, I do believe the bulk of what we're doing should be dedicated towards that. But at the same time, we are discussing exactly what you're talking about right now. What should we do to honor the 30th anniversary of that record? Yeah, that record is just, I mean, just phenomenal. I mean, where, where do you think the peak of where uh, Wasp was? Where, where do you think the peak is? Because I'm, I'm thinking it's got to be right around there for me. I think for that period, that record was the crescendo. And then, you know, the whole grunge thing happened after that. And all the bands of our genre kind of had to lay low for the better part of 10 years. And then we went through that period and we came out of that. I would say the last three records that we've done are probably as good as anything we've ever done. You know, and that's not just my opinion. You know, that's reflected in sales and, you know, the, the fan base as well. So... You know, any any artist that has a real career, you know, they're, the ride is it's a roller coaster. You know, nobody's on top forever. Nobody stays down forever. You know, it's constantly moving and, and morphing and changing. You know, and so that's been the story with us as well. We're no different than anybody else that's had a, a yeah. long career. Yeah, and you just talked about rehearsals. You, uh, when do you plan on starting them? Well, we've got a couple of Swedish festivals that we're going to do in two months. So we go, we're going to start a prolonged period of rehearsals prior to that because what we're, we're doing, we're going to use these festivals to start getting us ready for the fall. So in other words, we won't be doing just rehearsals for the festival. We're going to start working on what we know we're going to be doing later in the year to try to get a jump on that because we don't want to wait until the last minute because – the production of what we're doing is so extensive that we cannot wait until the fall to do it because a lot of this, the set is going to have to be built. There's been a, we've built a model of it already and it looks pretty cool, but obviously the model is not reality. So all that stuff, the production on it has to start months in advance. So we're going to use these rehearsals coming up to try to start pushing that process along. Yeah, all I can think of when you say that you, you know the models look pretty cool is just that that scene in in Spinal Tap with the Stonehenge. That's all. I... <laughs> <laughs> do, do you remember the first time you watched that movie? Yes, I do. Yeah, were, were you watching it with anyone we would know? Uh, Rod Smallwood, my manager. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you. I mean, you may not be aware, but Cherie Curry from the Runaways and myself did a commercial for Spinal Tap that is at the end of the movie after the credits roll. <laughs> I have to look that up again. All right. <laughs> so we go, Rod and I go to the the screening here in Hollywood at the Director's Guild for the movie. It hadn't even been released yet. The Director's Guild Theater here in Hollywood, it's about a 2,000 seat room. It's pretty big. We're sitting there. We, we don't know exactly what to expect because I remember... When I met with um, Michael McKeon and Chris Guest and Harry Shearer, I went in and had a meeting with them before we shot anything, a couple of days before. And we're sitting there, and they look like they normally do. Well, when it come time to do the shoot, they were part of the commercial as well. <laughs> they come walking out with all the stuff on them. My jaw dropped. <laughs> and so I had a fair idea of what this was going to be, but it wasn't until we went to the screening of the movie, 2,000 people literally falling out of their chairs <laughs> laughing, and Rod and I are sitting there stiff as a board like the condemned man going for the last walk. You know, it was not funny to me at all. <laughs> yeah, I bet, you know, yeah. Even to this day, you know, I'll watch it, you know, once every four or five years, and it's still... Yeah, I'm a little looser about it now than I was, but so much of it that's in that movie is stuff that's factual. Yeah, I, I think I was talking to, I don't know, David Coverdale or something. I think he was he was watching. Somebody was watching in the back room with Frankie Benelli, and I think Frankie, maybe Frankie told me that story, and he was laughing hysterically, and David Coverdale wasn't. He said, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, you know but, there's, I mean, I, on our first tour of America, it was us, Metallica, and Armored Saint. 
we got to a gig in Indianapolis one one afternoon. It was late, and because we'd had a long drive the night before, nobody got sound checks, and it was an old VFW hall that we were playing, and the dressing rooms were in the basement, and it was like a maze down there. And this was, we were alternating with uh, Metallica. One night they'd close, next night we'd close, and we'd flip-flop like that. Well, this happened to be one of the nights we were closing. So I'm downstairs in the bathroom, and I'm shaving. I hear Metallica's intro tape start to roll, and the door comes flying open. I'm shaving. I'm looking in the mirror, and I got the razor to my throat. I look behind me. There's Cliff standing there with his bass on. And he doesn't know how to get to the stage. <laughs> and he's telling me, he goes, Blackie, Blackie, how do I get to the stage? How do I get to the stage? And I hadn't been up there yet, so I didn't know myself. Because, like I said, we got there late. Nobody got sound checks, no nothing. So I didn't know where I was. And <laughs> he thought I was busting his chops. And I, I says, Cliff, I don't know. I'm looking at him in the mirror. He goes, oh, screw you, Blackie. And he runs off. <laughs> And finally, about two minutes later, I hear the bass come in after the band has already started. Cause, <laughs> you know, if you're downstairs in a basement, you can hear what's going on above you, you know. so it's, And so needless to say, I'm having flashbacks of the movie right there. Yeah, that's hysterical. Yeah, I bet when that scene came up, you yeah, that hit home pretty hard. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. You can't help but. You know, you, you talk about things happen. Yeah, yeah. I've oh, trust me. Yeah, I've interviewed enough of you guys. You know, uh, there's a lot of Spinal Tap stories out there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's the 40th anniversary of the band, and um, I don't know, this might be an idiotic question, but I just watched the uh, Randy Rhodes documentary over the weekend. Did you know Randy? A little bit. Did you see him play around the around L.A. or anything? Oh, yeah, sure. There used to be a place in town called Starwood, yeah. and Starwood was legendary, and Quiet Riot was one of the, the staples there. Yeah, and then, of Randy course... Randy used to have... Randy's mother had a... Um, a music studio over in Burbank, and Randy would teach over there. Yeah, they were talking about that in the documentary that uh, Randy was actually taking lessons, and after about nine months, uh, the guy came up to his mom and said, I can't teach Randy anymore, and she said, why not? He said, because he's teaching me stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah. Uh, just a couple more things here, and we'll let you uh, we'll let you fly here, Black. You do appreciate the time. Uh, uh, Chris Holmes, have you talked to him? you know anything about his health? No, uh, you know, we sent out a statement, you know, as soon as we heard, you know, that everybody in our camp wishes, certainly wishes him well and, you know, want the best for him. So what we had heard was that he's in France and he's living there and, um, you know, that the the uh, program that he was going to get into was going to take probably six months, you know, and that was maybe three months ago. Gotcha. You know, so... Yeah, so that's really all we know at this point. And uh, final, uh, finally, here the uh, the book, uh, your your biography, you're working on. Uh, any any mm-hmm. timeline about that, or anything you can tell us about that? You know, it's taken a whole lot longer than I thought it would, but it's been one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. It, it's a tremendous amount of work because you really there's so many things over the course of a lifetime that you forget about, especially when you do what we do for a living, because any anybody that does what we do, it's not like the average person out there where you go to work and you do your thing and you get into a routine. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, it's different. And I've often said that I've already, because of the schedule and the way that any band has to do things, you're here today, you're somewhere else tomorrow. It's like you've already lived four or five of somebody else's lifetimes and because of the amount of intensity that goes into the same amount of space that everybody has you know 24 hours for somebody that does this is not the same as 24 hours for somebody that's in a routine right and it can get a little on the insane side so when you have to you go back the first thing i did was interview everybody that i could think of and said what are your memories of this and so I got those, but then where I got the majority of it from was really going back in my own head. And the the deeper I got into it, the more things I had totally forgotten about. Yeah. You know, because it just, like I said, there's so many things that will happen in a given day that the only thing you remember 
is the most intense thing. But maybe the two or three other things that were just under it were just as intense, but you don't remember it. Yeah, they just led up to you know, it. You, you remember being on the flight the time the guys got angry with the stewardess and stuffed her in the overhead bin, <laughs> you know, but you don't remember the two or three things that happened under that. Right. <laughs> Did that happen? That's a true story, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is, a, that is a good story. So what, what have you learned about yourself from digging into your life? In the preface of the book, I write that this has been a process of discovery, both good and bad. I would say, after it's all said and done, that it's been far, far more good than bad because it's what it's done for me, it's been like writing a script to a movie. And again, like I said, there's a lot of stuff you forget about. But also, at the same time, what it does is it helps you connect the dots of your own life of maybe things that you didn't really think about were connected. And you go back and you look at it and you go, this is as plain as the nose on my face. Why couldn't I have seen this before? And there's been a number of incidences like that. You know, just things that are personal that might not, you know, be something that you could share with, with, with anybody else because it wouldn't make sense to them. But then again, there there may be things that are, you know, so... You know, I'm hoping that when people read this, they'll see a lot of themselves in it. You think it might be, and I mean, this is probably something you can't answer either, but do you think you might you, you might try to put out the the new record and the book simultaneously to kind of give it a little bit of that a pop? That was the plan. That was the plan to begin with, but the book is taking way much longer than I thought. Yeah. Because I'm only, I'm only going to, you know, we were talking about doing records and trying to get them right. Well, it's the same thing with this. I'm going to do it once, and I want it to be right. One of my friends uh, described the Guns N' Roses uh, Chinese Democracy record as like this porno he watched one time, and the girl kept sticking pencils into places where they don't belong, and she kept sticking them in and kept sticking them in. And it's like, that, that, I'm not going to tell you who said that, but uh, anyways, uh, that might be about this book. You just keep sticking pencils in there, and you're, you're not finished until you keep sticking pencils in there, right? <laughs> well... I mean, that sounds like some sort of whacked out voodoo hex you're talking about. But, you know, it's, you know, I just want to, I want to make sure that I turn over all the stones before I say it's done. Yeah, I hear you. Well, Blackie, I can uh, check this off my list. I've been in this business for 32 years. I, I've never had a chance to run across you for some reason. And now we've become best friends in 15 minutes. So this has been great. So. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll see you here in the fall in uh, Detroit. And uh, safe travels, and uh, really looking forward to the show. All right, take care now.